If you ever come to my house, knock upon my door wall. Somebody gon' tell you, baby, not to ever come back no more. Oh, and I know, yes, I know, just how classified. I know it's real here, what my mind is telling me. I know it's real here, what this one life lets me see. And I know, yes, I know, just how classified. Some call me crazy, but don't you call me out of my name. If you hurt my feelings, no one. Uh-huh. It don't mean that you know where I'm coming from Yes, I'm glad that I know now Everything's classified Yes, I'm glad that I know now Everybody's keeping a watchful eye Trouble come to my house Knock upon my door wall Somebody gonna tell her Tell me not where I come back No more wall And I know Yes I know Just how class of my high. Yes, I know just how to classify everything. Classify everything. Classify. I first picked up the guitar when I was about 14 years old after taking a lot of piano lessons, classical music and whatnot. And it was actually my younger brother who bought a guitar and got one with one of those little guys, the little student models. And he was playing and I said, hey, I want to do that. And, and strangely, I was the one who kept the guitar going. He kept the piano going. So um, we have a little duo that works out for that which is pretty cool. But yeah, I started when I was about 14 and learning classic rock tunes. And then as I dug deeper and I realized that the classic rock was coming from something else, I uh, started getting into the blues, the country blues, the, the picking styles. And then as I went to college and I didn't have any bandmates at that point, I was wanting to be my own band in a box. And uh, so I wanted to play like all those guys, Blind Blake and Reverend Gary and all, and all the different pickers, even Merle Travis and that type of stuff. So I started getting really into that and then really just exploring um, the rich tapestry of uh, American fingerstyle guitar and, and also stuff elsewhere too, Africa and whatnot. So that's how it all began. <laughs> Thank you. 
So I developed my own style of fingerstyle guitar based on the fact, for various reasons. One is that there are a lot of great accomplished pickers out there, uh, and I was having trouble finding my little space in all that. Um, and then it was also a real desire to gravitate towards other rhythmic things, the rhythmic sort of styles. So, and I discovered African styles of guitar playing, and I really, that really spoke to me in a bigger way. So I started mixing and, and cobbling different things together. And then when I discovered the guitar of Snook Ziglin in, in New Orleans, uh, that style and, and that type of music, I started thinking, oh, there's a lot of potential for that. Um, and so that, that helped me develop sort of the rumba techniques. And then more than that was just also just putting different rhythmic devices in there to kind of keep it punchy. So there's a lot of influences. A lot of it is from East Africa, West Africa. A lot of it is New Orleans. Some of it is kind of Rykooter and those types of guys, the way they play with that, that little extra little sort of backbeat. So that was all what was really drawing. I, I feel like as a player, I'm more of a percussive, sort of more uh, punchy player than I am a sort of uh, a linear player or something like that, if that, that makes any sense. So. In terms of the learning process for me of, of developing the guitar as a you know a main instrument for me that I really wanted to get better at, um, it was a long, kind of hard road actually because um, I'm you know there's not we're not there's no musicians really in my family and it was just sort of my brother and I were really interested and we got really into music and we we're encouraged to play music, uh, especially with, through the classical stuff the classical piano lessons and that instilled. A sense of discipline and a, and a, a knowledge of music that helped as sort of just a, ba a baseline from which we could spring to other other stuff. Um, so when it came to the guitar, it was it's 
I don't, it's hard to describe, understand why I went for that so much, but I just really, it just, you know, you, you never know why the stuff chooses you, but it does. All I know is that it was about when I was probably about 18 or 19, because for about four years I was, you know, I was playing Led Zeppelin, man, and, 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 and Beatles, and, and, and trying to do Hendrix and all this stuff. Um, and that was great, and it was a learning experience in its own right. But then it was there's something about the idea of using my fingers and playing and accompanying myself and playing older music that hark to a different era and then create my own stuff out of that, which really, I don't know, which became this sort of driving essential thing for me. Um, and it was, yeah, it was in this point in college and I think, uh, you know, it was when I, I, I put on these Mississippi John Hurt records and started listening to that. And he's kind of one of the more... Uh, accessible player. I mean, it's very beautiful style. Seems like he was such a beautiful human being, and the playing is is actually not that simple. But it it's it's stuff that you can start to learn how to play. And and, and as I started getting that, I, I I figured out I sort of unlocked that little secret of how to do that. I just remember being sort of having that epiphany, you know, when I was a, probably about 19 or something. I was thinking wow, I can do that, what else can I do now? And, and, you know, just getting really hungry. And then after that, I was going down for a couple trips down to Mississippi to that uh, Mississippi John Hurt Festival, and then we were playing with all sorts of people uh, from, uh, you know, from certain generation who, who, were, who had played with, the, uh, played with the original guys and stuff, and, and those guys taught me a lot, and and through instructional videos and through whatever, you know, that I learned and cobbled all this stuff together and then and created my style. But it was it was a lot of hard work, <laughs> I mean, and it still is. Yeah. I still feel like I have a lot to uh, progress on and, 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 and expand. So, but that's, that's what's great about it. <laughs> Give me red lipstick and the bright papa rouge, a shingle bob haircut and a shot of good booze. Her down, sweet daddy, come blow your horn. If you come too late, your mama will be gone. Every Sunday morning, church people watch me go. My wings brighted out, boy. Preacher told me so. Heard down, sweet daddy, come blow on your horn. If you come too late, your mama will be gone. Red rooster said, cock a doodle doo doo doo. Rich land woman said, and a dude will do. Her down, sweet daddy, come blow on your horn. If you come too late, your mama will be gone. Snooks Iglin's playing just completely blew me away. Why? It's hard to say exactly, but it, it, when you listen to it, it feels like he is the embodiment of all of New Orleans music, just kind of like he encapsulates it all on the guitar. There's others who do it on other instruments, but for me, like of all the guitar players out there, I mean, he just like, I, and I, 
I, so like this idea that he was a blind street singer, I don't know if he actually was the street. I mean, he probably was playing outside too, of course, but he was a studio guy apparently and all this stuff. So I think, you know, this guy was all over the place and was very proficient and very, very serious about what he was doing and, and, and respected in his, in his milieu or whatever. But it's just when I heard his, those first couple records of his, he was a young guy at the time. It's like, it goes from, you know, it goes all across, the, the, from high society, so like a brass band, like Louis Armstrong type stuff, to Ray Charles, to Bo Diddley, to, to Fats Domino. So, you know, and then that kind of Creole sound and everything. So it's just, for me, it was, and, and also very idiosyncratic. I think that is a, another key word, slash, you know, key term for him. It's like, you can't really figure out exactly what's going on. And there's like, it's not just, it, there's sort of complex harmony in what he's doing. I mean, it's not just straightforward stuff and you really have to listen to it. I mean, it's not modern jazz, but it's, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So it was, I just love the fact that it was right at that period in music that I really like where it's, you know, uh, he's taking all the, the country blues stuff, the picking, all that, those, those techniques, and then he's putting a little twist on it, both rhythmically and harmonically. And uh, uh, it's just like, wow, you know, so it does, and it doesn't get too cheeky or too modern sounding either, too kind of modern jazz sounding, which is, so I think that's, for me, Snooks is just, just the man. <laughs> Yes, I'm looking for a woman, world hard to set me down. I've been looking all night long, but just she can't be found. Yes, I met one last night and I told her what I like. Mm, I met one last night and I told her what I like. She said, get away from me, country boy. Go back to who your countryside. In terms of learning High Society by Snook Siglin, it was a very much a challenge and it was kind of at a time period, all actually in New York City uh, when I was living here where I was just getting things in the cans and, and really listening um, and trying to break everything down, whether it was Blind Blake, Gary Davis, Merle Travis, uh, you name it. And 
so Snooks was just part of that. I think he came in a little bit later after I, you know, when I was, after I had explored some of those other guys. And I just heard that and I was like, I need to do that. And I need to figure out, how he, I mean, I, there's no way you can actually do that, but you know, I got as close as I could and probably turned it into something else, I guess. But um, that it was just a challenge, but it was it was a really great challenge to uh, to figure out what he was doing and probably not actually getting all the exact chords and little passing chords and things that he does. I mean, he's if, I've 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 tried to play along to his um, his version of Ray Charles tune. I got a woman. It's like. I don't know, he adds all these little like weird little sort of jazzy chords in there that you're not quite sure if that's the exact chord he used or what. But anyway, so I, with High Society, that was definitely the case. And I just did my best to kind of find, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the ornamentation and the, the everything, just the, the, the color of, of what Snook Ziegler's music is, you know. I mean, I think it is pretty straightforward in certain respects. There's a lot of like, you know, the nines. And then, then you know, diminished chords and things like that. But it's just the way he he places all that stuff is pretty. It's pretty hard to imitate. But, so anyway, it was it just getting listening to it, stopping every five seconds, and and just breaking it down, and then putting it all together. It was a, I guess you could call that a labor of love. <laughs> I got into five-string banjo, especially clawhammer-style banjo. Uh, I guess it was just sort of at the end of college or right after, um, when I was just getting into this, all of this old folk music, you know, the, all the old blues and folk and whatever, and just, you know, and you know, hearing kind of like folks of my parents' generation were listening to the Harry Smith stuff and the folk anthology. It was I was listening to that. And I discovered all these records. There's one that was the Doc Watson and Clarence Ashley compilation, the, the two disc set by Smithsonian, released by the Smithsonian. And I just heard that, and I was like, "What is that banjo playing? I never heard such like I love that beautiful sound, very haunting sound, that kind of modal and soft. It wasn't the really you know loud bluegrass sound, which I like too. But it's I didn't I was never had that yearning to play that. Whereas all of a sudden I heard that I was like, I want to do that. Um, and then I started looking into it and seeing the, the and, and sort of grasping that the, the banjo is actually an African instrument and all this stuff. And that became, it sort of opened up a whole new uh, world for me. And, and also just applying the banjo to African music has been interesting. And it's especially, you know, in East Africa and in Ethiopia and stuff, you can, you can get these scales, play their scales relatively easily with the banjo. You just tweak it a little bit and your the fingering's there and it's done. So I, I just really like the banjo as a very kind of I don't know it's a it's, I just I just find it a beautiful instrument um, and particularly that claw hammer sound so uh, and then I got into claw the old time in a bigger way and started doing playing a lot of sessions and playing with folks here in the city and 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 then elsewhere and in France and everywhere so it was 
that was a whole world too. Actually, I mean, originally I grew up not I just in Connecticut uh, because my dad was working in the city. And then, so I always was coming into New York City. I mean, it's for me, it's like, it's like home in a way. Uh, although I haven't been, I don't come back very often now, which is kind of funny. But um, I used to live, I, about 10 years ago, I was living in New York City. I lived for two years in New York City with my wife, at the th girlfriend at the time. And... We were living in, in Brooklyn, and there's just ginkgo leaf, ginkgo trees all over the place. And they, I love their leaves, and then especially in the fall, they would turn yellow. And, then fall, and it was just there's something magical in all that. And so I, that little that rag that I that I that I wrote called ginkgo leaf rag just came out of that whole time period and that experience, um, which was part of my development as a musician and working with. I, I was going to the jams here in, in the West Village. The, Bag it in, playing old time music, and then the Jalopy Theater in Brooklyn. I started working there, which is now kind of a, a center of kind of folk music and of various kinds, uh, especially for the younger generation, but also for everyone. So um, it's that New York City is a very plays a very pivotal role for me in in my development as a as a musician, for sure. <laughs>
I don't know why I decided to tamper with that with East St. Louis Blues. Um, it was just something that happened, maybe because of the fact that there's a few things. One was that it's, uh, it was originally Blind Willie McTell, and he's like, I walked all the way from East St. Louis. I mean, it's, it's more uh, kind of, it doesn't have all that rhythmic stuff, but some of his, the way he placed, I mean, it sounded like he goes to the C sharp chord, and in the second I was just like, that is funky. <laughs> There's something cool in that, so I just decided to kind of start to mess with it, and then it evolved into its own thing. And I don't. Sometimes this stuff chooses you. You have no idea why it happens, and it just happens, and it evolves into something else. So I don't know. I just like that walk up. And I think that line is in there. I think that's in, in the original version, but um, so and that also provided me with some sort of uh, a reason to kind of mess with the rhythm a bit. So, but yeah, again, I, I have no real explanation for why I did that. It just ha and why that tune. Uh, I, I like the lyrics to it, and and I like the chord progression. So, it just evolved into something else. So. I write a lot of my own material. Some of it goes into a, if I were to describe my original music, I would describe it like as a three-pronged thing. One, it goes sort of a little more African. One is it goes a little more American blues, and the other is it goes more kind of banjo folk. Um, and that American blues, by that I mean, not, I mean, old school, you know, country blues, ragtime, that kind of thing. And then it can, it can be changed and modified from that, but that's, those are like the sort of the three 
sort of uh, main themes that sort of, or more or sort of, I don't know, places I gravitate to. And uh, in this case, in the case of Build Me a Weapon, which is that uh, the song, uh, with the slide, it's, it was, it probably started out of that police dog blues. Um, if I, I'll get back into that tuning. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going in on, on in that tune, and I've uh, it just Blind Blake was just so good um, as a as, and in terms of his playing, you you think it's fairly straightforward, and then you realize actually there's all this different stuff going on in there, um, especially with his you know it was Gary Davis who called him had a sporting right hand, right? I mean that that right hand, the right thumb of his is sensational, and I mean the. I just love that attack, um, and it just became a sort of a focal point for me is to try to get into that thumb draggy push, sort of a, you know, the the, the just the how do you call it the uh, just really put the emphasis right before the the beat and things like that, and, and then it lands on it when it lands, it's just like boom. So it's it was it was really important for me to try to develop my own style, but but really respecting that stuff because I just really loved it so much. So Build Me a Weapon came out of that. Um, you know, so it was kind of straight up picking, but then I do, you know, I do all this other stuff. So all that stuff comes, I think, a lot of my tunes, and I'm sure that's the case for a lot of people, is a lot of my tunes are inspired by another tune or another handful of tunes, and I just kind of, Hey, that's so good, but I'll, I'll, maybe I'll make my own version of that in a different way. So, you know, I think that's, that's, that's the way that happened. Gonna build me a weapon. It's a thing you've never ever seen. It's a glorious, big, bam, glorious machine. I'm gonna build me a weapon, take you by surprise. Make you wonder how you used to live your life. I'm going to build me a weapon that obeys your every word. You could be the sharpest shooter without drawing from your holster. I'm gonna build me a weapon, everyone to need to buy. And if you don't, you'll be hung out to dry. Be me a weapon. Buy me a weapon. We be a weapon. Or does it Oh, 
Does it I discovered uh, this DVD by the ethnomusicologist Gerhard Kubik called African Fingerstyle Guitar. Uh, this guy went all around Central, Eastern, and Southern Africa and this is from the 60s to the 80s and recorded these amazing uh, guitar players with some of them made their own guitars and it's, it's very, you know, very rootsy. But um, uh, this one particular guitar player's music really resonated with me. His name is Daniel Kachamba. I believe he died probably of AIDS when he was like 40 or something. Um, but the music in that clip is so beautiful in that it's very deceivingly simple. I mean, it sounds so nice and wow, he's just sitting there in, you know, in a pile of sand kind of playing his music. But when you actually try to play along to it, it's like, holy cow, how does he do that? Um, because he's only using thumb and index and they have that classic African thing of putting all their like Reverend Gary did that too, like pl planting all three fingers like that on the on the, on the, on the table here, on the, and it's basically, I can't do that, so I, I basically play it just the way I would normally play, but I, it took me a while to learn how to play along to his music. <laughs> but it's it's really, that what's really cool about it is it's, the index comes in and plays the, the kind of bass lines as well. That really, that style really just I found so beautiful, and it, as a result, I kind of applied it to a lot of different things. I have a song um, called "Chop It Up," which I, which kind of is taken right out of Kachamba's book with a little bit more of a Malian kind of sound. so on and so forth and so it's basically that kind of music really just opened my eyes to the potential rhythmic potential I think of fingerstyle guitar and then I got into some of this uh, Kenyan music and they're doing all those So that's all this kind of crazy um, polyrhythmic stuff, and that you know, and then it was just wow. It was, so I'm trying to explore all that now, is sort of mixing you know different rhythms onto you know. It's not always easy, and some people I'm sure are a little more proficient, but I'm I'm working at trying to get that you know like a six rhythm underneath uh, over a four rhythm and vice versa and things like that. So um, it's starting to happen. <laughs>
I've been living in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia for the past three and a half years um, because my wife, who works in development for the United Nations, and all, um, got, a, got a job there and said, hey, you want to move to Ethiopia? And I said, okay, that wouldn't be the first African country I would have picked. I would have probably picked maybe West Africa or somewhere like Kenya or somewhere else. But Ethiopia has been a major experience, a major adventure, and musically pretty interesting. Um, not so much as a, as a guitar player, but more, actually the banjo was very useful for me because uh, there's a five string instrument in Ethiopia called the Karar, and I could kind of mimic the Karar sound a bit with the, the banjo. And also they use these, a lot of, a series of different pentatonic tunings that are very kind of interesting and tense and, and uh, to get, to find the fingering, get into them, it was just a lot easier to use the banjo because I'm so used to constantly changing uh, tunings for the banjo anyway and because you're only using the four strings plus that fifth string, uh, the, the drone, it's easier than the guitar with all these six strings and trying to f figure out and change tunings and, and whatnot. I mean, I did apply some of that to the guitar as well, but it's, the banjo was very useful in the beginning. Um, so it's, and I have a band called Damakase, it's a new, it's our, it's a quartet, and uh, we just released the CD, and it's kind of a mix of Ethiopia and some other African music with a little bit of that old-timey stuff in there because of the way I play the banjo. So it's, it's been, it's been interesting. It's been a definite eye-opener. Okay, so as in terms of um, the, the technical side of things, in terms of the playing, uh, as I started getting into the finger style, I was having trouble uh, really, really getting the sound I wanted and playing without, without, you know, without hurting my fingers. I started off by just trying to grow up my nails and they were 
breaking, so I would end up getting my nails done at the salon. I'm sure I'm not the only one. Get these three done, thumb, index, middle, and uh, and that helped. Except then I, uh, you know, they were it was a little clunky. It was it, it was it helped me get the you know get really get the sound and get play loud. So that was great, but it wasn't ideal for the subtlety of of, of some some of the styles I play. So I stopped doing that. I went to finger picks for a while, but then I I didn't like that either. Actually, to be honest, I personally it wasn't doing it for me in terms of uh, uh, it was it was always just kind of getting caught in there. It was I had a resonator guitar, and when I was playing outside with people busking or whatever, that was great. But otherwise, uh, for you know playing on this type of guitar, I literally I just I I got away from picks. I even don't even use a thumb pick anymore. I used to use just a thumb pick for a while. I don't use that anymore. I just file these down as much as possible to keep them as strong as possible. Of course, if there's a break, it happens. And then, worst case, if I if I've really broken almost all the nail off, then I'll get get go to the nail salon. Otherwise, I just a little bit a nail that's pretty tough will will get me along. Get me is exactly what I need. And uh, and then just develop the skin on the on the fingers and kind of toughen them up a bit. That's it. In the red lipstick and the bright papyrus, a shingle bob hair. 